some have spoken of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the masses. We need a government of action. Right before Trotsky died, he had a big fight among his followers. In 1939, uh, at that point, uh, you had the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. The Soviet Union had gone to every other Western country to try and form an alliance against the Nazis, and to, to try and form an alliance, and none of them would. And the Soviets, anticipating a Nazi invasion, they went to the Nazis and they signed a non-aggression pact. Uh, they drew a line through Europe and they said, basically, at this point, uh, neither side shall, shall cross this line. And they signed that pact as a way to preserve themselves as they saw that a Nazi invasion was pretty much inevitable and it was a way to buy time. And of course, the U.S. media went into an anti-communist overdrive in response to that. Time magazine started calling the Communist Party USA the Communazis. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. And also, at, at the time, Trotsky, he didn't exactly support it. He said that the Soviet Union had the right to make the pact, but that they had gone about it in an unprincipled way, etc. He didn't exactly support it. But there were, there were three followers of Leon Trotsky in New York City, Max Schachtman, Martin Abern, and James Burnham. And they had a clique of followers of thousands of people who followed them. And they announced that because of the pact of 1939, uh, that the Soviet Union clearly was not a socialist or a deformed workers state anymore. It was, clearly, it was clearly state capitalism, or it was bureaucratic collectivism, or it was clearly just somehow not a socialist society because this pact had been signed. And Trotsky had a big fight with his followers over this question. There's a book called In Defense of Marxism by Trotsky where he argues with his followers over this question. And then the Socialist Workers Party published a book called The Struggle for a Proletarian Party over this question as well. Trotsky's writing and in the writing of James Cannon, the leader of the Socialist Workers Party, they assessed that this clique that said the Soviet Union was no longer a deformed workers state, it was clearly capitalist or bureaucratic collectivist, uh, that this group was motivated by their class, that these were New York City intellectuals, these were academics, college professors and such, and that they, they basically wanted, they did not want to align with the working class and the struggle against imperialism. Instead, uh, they wanted to be somewhere in between. They called themselves third camp Trotskyists. Now, one of those third camp Trotskyists was a man named Irving Kristol. To that, you say that they You've been a neo-Marxist, a neo-Trotskyist, a neo-socialist, a neo-liberal, and finally a neo-conservative. That pretty much traces the trajectory of, trajectory of my political beliefs. Um, I, I've never been comfortable with any of those doctrines because I always saw problems inherent in those doctrines. I did not want ever to be a Stalinist. I was always uh, critical of Stalinist Russia. Uh, on the other hand, I found myself, when I was a young socialist, more and more critical of the teachings of Leon Trotsky, and more and more skeptical of them. So I was a neo. Talk about the different alcoves where people sat. Yes. Which one were you in? Alcove one, which was the anti-communist or anti-Stalinist alcove where socialists of various kinds and some liberals would congregate and argue and exchange ideas. Uh, and it was a very nice alcove. It was my second home. Was that in the cafeteria? Yes. All the alcoves were, went, were in an arc around the cafeteria. Anybody uh, in that alcove that we would know? Any names that we recognize? Oh, yes. Some of them, anyhow. Uh, Daniel Bell, Melvin Lasky, 
Philip Selznick, now Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Berkeley, Seymour Martin Lipset, uh, also had been a professor for many years at Berkeley. Um, a lot of people who became fairly well-known academics were in that. Irving Howe was in that alcove, became a well-known literary critic. So, uh, in terms of subsequent careers, the alcove produced quite a lot of uh, people of some distinction. Who was an alcove too? The communists, that is to say, the Stalinists, the people who were apologetic for the Soviet Union. And they did not produce, <laughs> I think, as many distinguished people as we did. Irving Kristol, according to his New York Times obituary, uh, he was a socialist and a Trotskyist until he got drafted into the U.S. military during World War II. He says that he had been talking about the American people and the working class, but then, after actually meeting some members of the working class in the U.S. military, he said, quote, I can't build socialism with these people. They'll probably take it over and make a racket out of it. And it was discussed with the American working class. That's a quote from his New York Times obituary. It was, it was, it was actually serving in the U.S. military alongside actual American workers that convinced him to stop being a socialist. But it's interesting because the New York Times obituary says he stopped being a socialist during World War II. But after, after the Second World War, he still was hanging around with a lot of these New York intellectuals, still writing for socialist publications. But then something happened. So in 1949, the Communist Party USA did something utterly amazing. Okay? They had the Waldorf Peace Conference. Now, you know, all of us have seen how difficult it has been for us to have this conference here in the middle of the woods in Pennsylvania, right? Now, can you imagine organizing a huge conference in the middle of New York City with Albert Einstein and Shostakovich and Aaron Copeland and some of the most amazing writers and scientists and intellectuals from all over the world, Oppenheimer, the physicist, at a time when it's illegal to be a communist, when the national board of the Communist Party is in federal prison. Uh, and the fact that they pulled off in 1949, they had the Waldorf Peace Conference in New York City, was utterly amazing. And, and they got so many big name intellectuals to come to this conference and say the Soviet Union was right and American imperialism was wrong. In public, in, in, in New York City, at the middle of, of McCarthyism, it was nothing short of a miracle what they did at the Waldorf Peace Conference. It was an amazing feat, just an utterly amazing feat. But Irving Kristol and his pals, the New York City intellectuals, they, of course, were protesting it. And so an organization called the Central Intelligence Agency was quite disappointed by the fact that so many great scientists and artists and intellectuals had gone to this Soviet conference. How could all these smart people be communists? I mean, there couldn't possibly be any arguments in their favor. We know that. But so, you know, so, so what, how could this have happened? So they went to Irving Kristol. And Irving Kristol became the founder of a CIA-funded organization called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And Along with the Congress for Cultural Freedom, uh, you, you know, you had a number of magazines that were covertly funded by the CIA, the Partisan Review, uh, the Paris Review, uh, Encounter, uh, a number of these magazines, Der Monat in Germany. And these were leftist socialist magazines that critiqued U.S. society, critiqued American capitalism, but also demonized and attacked anyone who was supportive of the Soviet Union. You admit to working for the CIA. Yeah. What's that about? Oh, back in the 1950s, uh, I was in London co-editing Encounter magazine with Stephen Spender. And I left at the end of 1958. Stephen and I founded the magazine in early 53. I left at the end of 58. And then, I guess it was in the mid-60s or thereabouts, that it was revealed that, in fact, we thought we were being subsidized by an American foundation called the Farfield Foundation. And in fact, that was a front for the CIA, and it was CIA money. How'd you find and out? It was made public in the press. I don't know how they found out. Somebody leaked, obviously. Uh, but I didn't inquire, and I didn't care, really. There was some government money behind it, but the question occurred to me that just occurred to you. Why on earth would they want to fund a magazine that Stephen Spender and I were editing and which, whose general political outlook was liberal, not at all conservative? Uh, this was, after all, in the Eisenhower years. Uh, Mr. Dulles, I believe, was then head of the CIA. 
It didn't make any sense to me. But it turned out, in fact, there was a liberal group within the CIA that uh, thought it very important to have an intellectual magazine in Europe and indeed worldwide. We were an English language magazine and in the end pretty much a British magazine, but the idea was that we were supposed to be more cosmopolitan than that. And they decided to support the magazine, and once they started supporting it, it was a very successful magazine. They became very proud of it, and uh, didn't let it go until they had to. This magazine, Partisan Review, was everywhere. And a lot of big names wrote for the magazine. Hannah Arendt. Ooh. Yeah. Susan Sontag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're going to do it all day. <laughs> um, an individual named Irving Howe, who became the founder of Democratic Socialists of America, was a, a, a writer for Partisan Review as well, uh, as was Mary McCarthy. The magazine is everywhere. It's offering a critique of American capitalism, but also demonizing and attacking the Soviet Union. But it's also doing some other interesting things. The magazine kind of redefines what fascism is. So what is fascism? We Marxists have always understood that fascism is a form of Bonapartism. When there's a capitalist crisis, one section of the ruling class tries to seize control of the government. In order to do it, they build a mass movement. And then, as they seize control of the government, they engage in mass violence and terror and destruction to try and stabilize the economy. Right? The Nazis took control of Germany, and they put half the country in concentration camps and the other half in military uniforms, and they stabilized the economy for a little bit, and then they had to have World War II because it doesn't work in the long term. But it was a Bonapartist maneuver, right? And that fascism is a form of Bonapartism rooted in mass destruction and terror. It's basically if we can tear down and kill and imprison and have slave labor, we can stimulate the economy and save capitalism from a crisis. That's fascism. That is a Marxist material understanding of what fascism is. Fascism is not an aesthetic. Fascism is not a feeling, right? Fascism is pretty clear what it is. Fascism is, is an economic mode, an attempt to save capitalism with mass destruction. But with Hannah Arendt and with Susan Sontag and some of these other intellectuals, we get a redefinition of fascism, where a fascism is people organizing in groups. Basically, if you read it, uh, Hannah Arendt, her big book is called Eichmann in Jerusalem. And when I first read that book in high school, I thought it was a great book, right? The message of the book is that there was this Nazi war criminal, Adolf Eichmann, who'd been hiding in Argentina. The Mossad arrested him and took him to Jerusalem. He was put on trial for Nazi war crimes, and he was hanged. And Hannah Arendt, she, she calls her book on Adolf Eichmann, she calls it Studying the Banality of Evil. And she writes all about how Adolf Eichmann was just a normal guy. He'd been in the YMCA, and after that, he joined the Nazi party, and that she was expecting him to be some kind of monstrous, hateful, evil person, but he seemed like just a normal, average person. Now, at the time I read the book, as someone who's kind of non-conforming and kind of a nerdy guy, I liked it because I thought, see, all these conforming people around me who can't think and are not critical of society, well, they're all Eichmanns, and that's why we've got to have free thinkers and intellectuals. That's how I took it. But there's a subtle undertone to it. The subtle undertone is that deep down, the broad masses of people are all a bunch of Nazis, right? Deep down, the people are dangerous. Deep down, the people are the enemy. That's basically the message. And you get that same message from Susan Sontag when she says that fascism is groups of people assembling, when fascism is the dramaturgy, you know, you know uh, fascism is gymnastics, and, and she's listing off this fascist aesthetic, and it's suddenly this, this understanding. And what this really is, this is the middle class intellectuals and their fear of the people, right? They're afraid of the people yeah. mobilizing. And they can't understand the difference between fascism and communism. To them, whenever the rabble get together and start demanding and fighting for their rights, that's fascism. And Susan Sontag went as far as actually saying that she considered communism to be the most effective form of fascism. So this is particularly interesting. So in 1977, you have the Academy Awards in the United States, the Oscars, right? And in 1977, at that point, you know, the world, there's a huge amount of national liberation struggles. Communism is, is strong. The USA has just been defeated in Vietnam. They gave a standing ovation to Lillian Hellman. Do folks know the name Lillian Hellman? Yeah, yeah well, I'm going to put her on the board here. This is Lillian Hellman. All right? Yes. Yeah. And Jane Fonda, who had protested the Vietnam War, she said this. She said, she was summoned before a congressional committee, the House Un-American Activities Committee, 
And that was, in fact, a travesty of human rights. She offered to testify about herself, but refused to speak about anyone else. She was blacklisted and for years unable to earn her living as a writer. She returns to us tonight, her conscience intact, still a lover of films. And it is with great pride I introduce to you tonight my friend Lillian Hellman. Now, Lillian Hellman is an amazing writer. The first Broadway play ever to talk about LGBT rights was written by Lillian Hellman. It's called The Children's Hour. It's a beautiful play about two women who run an orphanage, and then there's a rumor started that they are lesbians, and it destroys their, destroys their business, and then the one woman confesses that she does have some lesbian feelings and commits suicide. It's very sad. But to talk about LGBT rights in 1936 was pretty bold. That's Lillian Hellman. Lillian Hellman wrote a beautiful Hollywood movie called The North Star about a group of Ukrainian villagers fighting off the Nazi invaders. It's an amazing film. I recommend you check it out. Lillian Hellman wrote an anti-fascist piece called Watch on the Rhine. Um, it's also very amazing. And they also, they made a movie about Lillian Hellman called Julia. And it was about a childhood friend that Lillian Hellman had had who had been from a wealthy family but had become an underground anti-Nazi resistance fighter during the Second World War. So they made this film. And Vanessa Redgrave, the actress, uh, who was, was a communist, who was a Trotskyite, but she had supported Gaddafi and all of that, she won, she won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress for her role in Julia. And that's the next year at the Oscars. Vanessa Redgrave, she's been hanging out with Gaddafi, and she's made a documentary supporting the Palestinians. So the Jewish Defense League has been threatening to bomb the Academy Awards if she wins. But she wins anyway. And so she gets up to the podium, and she makes this speech. She says... In the last few weeks, you have stood firm and refused to be intimidated by the threat of a small bunch of Zionist hoodlums whose behavior is an insult to the stature of Jews all over the world and to their great heroic record of struggle against fascism and oppression. That's how she accepted her Academy Award. So, interestingly enough, um, and that, this is Vanessa Redgrave, by the way. We'll put her up, up next to... Uh, Put her up here. So, of course, Lillian Hellman, who calls herself an unrepentant Stalinist and is very proud of her work in support of the Soviet Union, refuses to apologize. Because there were many intellectuals during the 1930s and such who had, had defended the Soviet Union, but then apologized. Lillian Hellman, who refuses to do that. We have Mary McCarthy. Mary McCarthy, who's associated with Partisan Review, launches an all-out attack on Lillian Hellman. And all over the newspapers in the United States, they start saying that Lillian Hellman is a fraud on the basis of the name of some churches in her memoirs being wrong, on the basis of some little details being incorrect, and all over the press, it's cancel culture. They cancel Lillian Hellman. And they say she's a fraud, she's a Stalinist, and they go after a woman who's in her 70s and basically destroy Lillian Hellman's reputation. But the more you look into it, she was probably telling the truth in her memoirs, and her writing and her activism is, I mean, her record is very, very admired. And the individual who launches the attack, Mary McCarthy, is a partisan review, Congress for Cultural Freedom uh, person. And in fact, she goes as far as on national television saying, that, they, saying, quote, every word she writes is a lie, including and and the. <laughs> at, at which point... Lillian Hellman sued, uh, sued Mary McCarthy, say, yeah. saying that on multiple occasions she had said many true things. Yeah. So yeah. that's worth noting. Now, I also want to talk about MKUltra, Project uh, MKUltra. Yeah. This is another CIA pro program where the CIA is doing experiments with hallucinogens and the effects of hallucinogens. It's pretty clear that the CIA was distributing LSD and hallucinogens throughout the public. Uh, there was Operation Midnight Climax in San Francisco where they were distributing rant drugs to random people on the street. They were going to brothels and kind of holding the men there against their will and giving them LSD, assuming they would never tell anybody because they didn't want to know where they were. And uh, that's pretty intense. And uh, Fidel Castro actually talked about MK Ultra in one of his columns. Uh, he wrote, human beings were used as guinea pigs for its lethal experiments, which on many occasions included the use of LSD. According to recently released CIA documents, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, Alan Dulles purchased over 100 million doses of LSD, almost all of which flooded the streets of the United States during the late 60s. Thousands of graduate students served as guinea pigs, and soon they were synthesizing their own acid. The overwhelming majority of anti-war protesters went into Students for a Democratic Society on the basis of outrage at developments in Vietnam. 
But once they were caught in the environment designed by the Tavistock Institute's psychological warfare experiments and inundated with a message of hedonism, their sense of values and their creative potential went up in a cloud of hashish smoke. The open cultural warfare, although undeclared against American youth, truly began in 1967. By means of a secret weapon, they managed to draw more than four million youth into so-called festivals. Without knowing it, they became victims of a perfectly planned experiment that involved the use of drugs on a large scale. So, you know, this is, this is, there was drugs being widely distributed. I mean, there's a lot written about this. I mean, many people will, will say it is a well-acknowledged fact that the CIA turned on America. You can read the history of the electric Kool-Aid acid test and all that. What's also interesting to note, though, so the Beatles only had one tour of the United States. Uh, and they were touring the country, and they were shot at, and there were bomb threats against them. And based on that tour, they never toured again. And what had happened? Well, they were going through the South and through different parts of the United States and the Midwest, and they were being shot at and threatened, and people were burning record albums in the name of religion. The idea was that John Lennon had given an interview where he was critical of Christianity, and so the Beatles were anti-Christian. The Beatles made a statement in all the newspapers that they're getting more better than uh, Jesus himself, and the Ku Klux Klan, being a religious order, is going to come out here the night that they appear at the Colosseum here, and we're going to demonstrate with uh, different ways and tactics to stop this performance, the Klan is going to come out here because we're the only organization that will come out and make a stop to these accusations. This is nothing but blasphemy, and we're going to try to stop it any terror way we can, but it's going to stop. We're known as a terror organization. I think we have a terror organization. We have ways and means to stop this if uh, this is going to be the case. Yes. Well, what uh, what ways and means? Well, I don't want to say this, but uh, there'll be a lot of surprises uh, Monday night, I believe, when they get it. But what was really underlying this was that there were two strategies about how to defeat communism. And this goes, back to, this goes back to the 30s. There's one faction of the ruling class that thinks the best way to defeat communism is by building a kind of fascist military state. Lots of military spending, crush the labor movement, build an authoritarian society. That's the way to defeat communism. But there's another faction that argues the opposite. Instead of tightening up the United States and making it more authoritarian, create lots of chaos that will then loosen up the society, make sure that no solid leftist organization can be formed amid this chaos, and spread that chaos into the communist and, and anti-imperialist countries to tear them down. And that, those two strategies have been playing out. And there's a long-standing rivalry between the military-industrial complex of the United States, which favors the first strategy of an authoritarian state and military spending, and the CIA and the intelligence apparatus that have a second strategy of spreading chaos. And they have fought against each other. There's a very good book, The Yankee and Cowboy War, that talks about this divide in the ruling class and this, this difference in strategies. I also wanted to mention uh, this guy. Zbigniew Brzezinski. Oh, yeah. Right? Now, Zbigniew Brzezinski was the main Cold War strategist after the U.S. was defeated in Vietnam. The USA was defeated in Vietnam, and there was a feeling that these big wars that the United States was waging, these big dramatic military involvements, you know, killing a million people in Vietnam, killing a million people in Korea, uh, that this was a little bit of a problem, and it hurt the image of the United States around the world, and, the, you know, the protest movement and disruption within the ranks of the U.S. military was just making it not feasible. And Brzezinski emphasized soft power and the use of soft power methods. And we talk about, you know, in 1978, I talked about Afghanistan. There was a whole public relations campaign to make Osama bin Laden and al Zarqawi look like Che Guevara. I don't know if people have seen, I believe there's a James Bond movie, The Living Daylights, uh, that's dedicated to the Mujahideen of Afghanistan, you know, heroically fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. And there was a whole effort to hijack left-wing aesthetics and give the Soviet Union a Vietnam. And that's actually the term he used. He did an interview later uh, in the 1990s where he said that he had created the Afghan trap. He had, he had created a situation where the Soviet Union felt it had to intervene in Afghanistan in order to, quote, give the Soviet Union their own Vietnam. At the time that middle America was angry about the Beatles and was protesting against the Beatles, 
Um, many people have speculated that the Beatles concerts, rock and roll and all of that, part of what probably disturbed a lot of these pastors about it was that going to a Beatles concert was a lot like going to an old time Pentecostal church service, right? The rhythmic music, the shaking, the dancing and all of that. And it had the same kind of hypnotic effect on the audience, except the Beatles did not have a religious or spiritual message. And in a way, it was a threat to a lot of these, these preachers and such. But overall, there was also a feeling in middle America that this chaos that was being used as a method to fight communism was also a threat to them, was also a threat to middle America. There was a feeling that this was kind of an attack on middle America and their way of life, and that this, this chaos, as it spread to their communities, might come and hurt them as well. And there was kind of, you can interpret the culture war in a lot of ways as middle America feeling threatened by the CIA and their strategy of LSD and chaos and, and globalism as a method for defeating communism. And you can interpret it that this way. And I, I guess I just want to end this section by talking about QAnon. QAnon is not true, obviously. The idea that there's a bunch of satanic pedophiles and Trump is, was fighting them on the inside, it's ridiculous. <laughs> But is it incorrect to say that the rich are quite evil in their views? Is it incorrect to say that the rich have a world view that, that puts their own money and their own self above others? Is it incorrect to say that the rich, uh, the rich don't particularly care uh, about working people in the United States or the future that they have? Is it, is it incorrect uh, to say that, that the, rich, uh, the rich, rich lack any, any real moral values? Is that incorrect? It's not incorrect. The narrative, the overall you know, story they have is incorrect, but the understanding is based in reality. And so the idea that, that QAnon are our enemies and that, that working people who voted for Trump should be treated like the enemy, no, in a way, they're kind of starting to get it. They just don't get it yet. Our job is to help them to get it. That understanding is really missing from left-wing circles in so many ways. So that's how I wanted to end this section. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, let's have some discussion. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so this past week we saw a, I guess like a committee hearing by like a West Point um, general speaking on, I guess like how they study critical race theory and a lot of like white rage or like things that you would understand to be kind of a part of um, liberal arts, um, like academia. How would, would you say, say that that's sort of like a synthesis of that like undoing and the military industrial complex? Or like how, do you, how would you make like sense of the fact that the military is starting to kind of, especially with like the woke CIA ad, how, like uh, how they are incorporating that okay. into imperialism? I think there's clearly a fight behind closed doors. January 6th could not have happened without a lot of forces in the government allowing it to happen and wanting it to happen for their own reasons. And, you know, I, I, you know, I know nowadays in a lot of high schools you read Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States as an official textbook. But I can guarantee you that the Pentagon brass don't want their kids reading Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States in, the, in their textbooks. And that there is a division within the ruling class that is very deep. Um, and that while the liberal ideas uh, are predominant among one faction of the ruling class, uh, especially among the policing agencies and the military, there is a pushback and an opposition to them. And that is the basis of some of what's going on. Some of it's just material. The military industrial complex makes money by blowing stuff up, right? And, and soft power involves spending a lot of money and not making money by blowing things up. And, and part of it is just a financial interest. Um, but at the same time, there, there is a difference. Uh, you know, in the Hillary Clinton State Department, they talked about an open international system, right? They, they talked about the world. There are two forces in the world. There's populism and the open international system. And they, they equated Pinochet and Evo Morales and China with populism and Russia. And, and the open international system is coming out of the West, right? And that there's this talk about illiberalism, right? And equating the anti-imperialist states with the new right in Europe and, and it's populism versus the open international system. This is how they see things. And they want global revolution to create an open international system. They're Trotskyites for capitalism. They're permanent revolutionaries for capitalism. Uh, and they don't mind uh, economically destroying the United States in the process. They want one global open international system. 
uh, whereas you do have some lower level capitalists, you know, who were with Trump that, that had a different perspective. I think uh, one, of the, one of the things that we shouldn't shy away from, um, and I'm glad that we're having the conversation here, is uh, the idea of uh, the globalism, globalization. You know, starting in 99 uh, when some left uh, parties and, you know, some activists started talking about alter globalization or anti-globalization. Um, and actually, I was at a conference in China a few years ago, um, and uh, a Marxist professor from Slovenia got up and spoke against globalization and got a rounding uh, applause because actually... The, the Chinese professors and what he was trying to argue was that we're internationalists, we're not globalists. You know, we want countries to have their sovereignty, we want countries to have their self-determination. And one day in some unforeseen future, maybe we'll have a one world united. But for now, the point is to safeguard countries, to safeguard their sovereignty, to safeguard their self-determination, to allow for cultural expression and flourishing in, the, in, their, in its rich diversity, and to have this mutual solidarity. But global, globalism, and globalization seeks to crush sovereignty and to tear down borders and to go in there for corporations to do what they want, to ransack countries, and then to have the cultural imperial wing to go in there and uh, to spread all of the, the, the cultural forms from here. The Hollywood, you know, the drugs, the pornography, all that stuff. So we got a standing ovation and some of the other, there were some American academics over there who were very like, you know, kind of like taken aback because they thought this was sort of like conspiracy language. But it really isn't. A lot of the left internationally are saying, wait a minute, we don't want you to come in here and just rampage our countries and our uh, cultures and our political institutions. We have our own ways. You have your own ways. But there should be a mutual uh, exchange and something that benefits both of us, but not just a one-sided uh, train coming in here and taking what they want. And I think that's something important to be aware if people call you conspiracy theorists and things like that for this stuff. It's very much rooted in our tradition.